Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here, and uh, thank you, Eleonora, and for the organizing team for organizing this great, great event. My name is Julie. I'm here today on behalf of uh, Walmart. So our vision at Walmart is to inspire and drive an inclusive human presence uh, beyond Earth. So I'm Julie, I'm an astrobiologist, so I uh, have a research degree in Earth and Planetary Sciences, and I'm going to continue with a PhD uh, in astrobiology at the Origins Institute in Toronto, in Canada. I'm also the current uh, crew commander and geologist of our next mission coming up later this year. And today with me, Lorraine. Hi everyone, I'm Lorraine, I'm an aerospace engineer currently working as a consultant for the French Space Agency. Um, so we're only two today, but uh, it's actually six of us, um, and we're all females. This is one of the specificity of uh, Walmart. Uh, so we have Lauren at the uh, top left corner. Uh, then we have Marta. She's uh, actually based in London, uh, but she's uh, defending her uh, PhD thesis uh, in a couple of days in uh, uh, aerospace materials. Then we have Paula. She's based in Barcelona. She's a PhD candidate in uh, neurosciences. Uh, Christina, she's based in London as well, former uh, uh, space, in, yeah, space engineering student at uh, Cranfield. Uh, uh, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> and then we have uh, Alice, she's French but currently based in Rome and she works for uh, ESA. Um, so what is Walmart? So it's an all-female crew of uh, analog astronauts and STEM professionals. And it actually started in summer 2019 when Lorraine and Marta met uh, via LinkedIn. And after a couple of months, we created this uh, all-female crew and we applied to the uh, Mars Society MDRS Mars Research Desert Station uh, field campaign. And why all female? Well, the, the first reason for it is to collect data on the women in space-like environments that is currently missing in the literature. So as we uh, saw it during the high seas presentation, there's very few all-female crews. Uh, so that's why it's very relevant to actually collect data. Um, so Walmart is first and foremost a non-profit organization. It's based in Geneva, in Switzerland, because I'm based in Geneva. And we have three types of uh, activities that correspond to three types of missions. We have our analog missions, uh, the missionario. Uh, we have our survival trainings, uh, which would be more appropriately called extreme environment trainings, uh, the mission magnamata, and finally we have the mo more like fun team building parts, which are team building weekends for the mission mete. A quick um, overview on the timeline of the project. So it started in summer 2019. The crew was fully formed in October 2019, and we sent our application to the Mars Society, uh, and we actually got accepted in January 2020. Uh, following the acceptance, we had to go through a couple of crowdfunding to secure our spot at the research station. Uh, they were quite successful, um, and then we actually founded the legal entity of Walmart in October 2020, and our first. Uh, date, launch date for our first analog mission was set in February 2021 uh, in the middle of COVID, so of course we had to postpone twice actually. Um, in the meantime, we had a couple of um, conferences that we attended. Uh, one of them was the IIF GLEX conference in St. Petersburg that Lauren will talk a bit more uh, about later. Um, last year, so a couple of months ago, we had our first uh, technical survival training uh, in France in October, Magna Mata 1. Uh, we're going to have our first fun team building session all together in London uh, this summer in July. And finally, eventually, we'll have our first uh, analog mission at uh, the Mars uh, Research Station, Mission Nero 1. And 
So as Julie mentioned, uh, magnetic missions are linked to survival training, extreme conditions training. The idea is to get out of the comfort zone in order to be more efficient under uh, an, an enormous, my apologies, an amount of stress. So uh, for the first mission, we had uh, Damien Le Couvet, who's a French explorer, help us build uh, survival training for four days. So it was four days of uh, team communication, team building, cooperation, stress management, as I mentioned, and evolving extreme conditions. Um, and the output of this uh, activity, of this, yes, of this activity, was an enhanced team cohesion and dynamic. Was, uh, it, which was a great preparation for the Mars Desert Research Station because we had actually never met before the six of us in the same room because of COVID. So it was nice to finally get to see the six of us all together and to go through this experience which was extremely hot and uh, just having each other's back really helped us bond uh, as a crew. So that was great to have this experience with uh, Time on Target. Uh, so, more detail on what we did, so we had some rope techniques, so Daniel Couvet, as I mentioned, is an explorer, but before that he was a special forces in the French army, so he, of course, knows all about uh, rope technique. He was actually uh, responsible for designing the protocol uh, in case of being captured in hostile territories for the French and Belgian army, so he knows what he's talking about. Uh, and he actually captured us, uh, which was very stressful. Uh, the first 20 minutes you're wondering if it's actually a scenario, a simulation or not, because uh, did we pay him? Yes, we did. Does anyone know where we are? No, they don't. Uh, <laughs> so you do have this time where you're like, uh, yeah, I just got tied up at the very bottom of a cave somewhere in the forest. That is not good. <laughs> so that was a great training. Um, and we also had more, um, more practical um, skills like navigation by night and a night with no equipment, so no tent or no sleeping bag, which uh, was of course the only night where we had a storm, so that was fun. Uh, we slept so well, as you can imagine. Uh, the next morning photos are quite compelling, it's just us half dead, you know. But we did it, we survived. And um, so... <laughs> Let me present the mission Nerio. So as Julie mentioned, those are your, our analog missions. So we want so the first one is at the Mars at Research Station. We hope that the next one maybe will be at high seas, lunaris or something like this. But for this one, so um, this is a station owned by the Mars Society. You had a great presentation on it this morning I heard with Shannon Rupert, who's the director of the MDRS. So I won't expend too much on, on the station in itself. Uh, so we'll be going, hopefully, knock on wood, uh, next November, next October actually, uh, for two weeks. And um, the idea is that each crew member has different experiments to take uh, with them. So if we go through them, we have the Martian airship, which I will present right after because it's my project, and it's with EPFL students, so it will talk to some of you. <laughs> Hyperspectral imaging is by Alice, uh, our crew data scientist, uh, and is an engineer, and she is collaborating with um, a startup in France who is going to lend, them, lend her a uh, hyperspectral camera in order, to, in order to collect data on the station. We have biosignature by Julie, which uh, she'll explain later. Um, gender crew domination, which is really at the core of, um, of our experiment. It's with Dr. Popovite. Uh, I mentioned her name because some of you who have already been on analog missions might know her. She's, um, she, she's a doctor from the University of Iowa collecting data on various MDRS crews uh, in order to understand the behavior of analog astronauts and how they cope with being isolated on the MDRS. And for her it's quite interesting because we are the first all-female crew to be studied uh, by her. Um, just to give you uh, an idea, we are, so the, the MDRS was founded in 2001, 2001, and we are the third all-female crew uh, of the station, so it's not very common. Um, energy optimization is me, I will mention it, I will talk about it a bit later, and AR for astronaut training is with Christina. Um, as you can imagine, AR is a tremendous tool in order to escape 
It's the current environment you're in, and when that environment is a tin can 400 kilometers in attitude, it's very nice to be able to escape. Uh, so it, AR has played a more and more important role uh, for human space exploration uh, as a way for astronauts to reconnect with Earth, with uh, people on Earth, so with their family and friends. So that's uh, something we look forward to. Um, as I said, Shannon Rupert, I'm sure, did an excellent job at presenting the station, but here you have a nice photo of it. It's in the desert of Utah in the US, and it is operated by the Mars Society. Now, the Martian airship. Um, the Martian airship is a preliminary feasibility study of an airship as a mean of exploration of the red planet. And uh, now you tell me, well, with 1% of the pressure of the Mars as there is on Earth, how the hell are you going to fly an airship? Well, the question is not how, it's where. Because, of course, you're not going to fly an airship at the top of Mount Olympus. However, if you go very deep in canyons, the pressure goes higher because you're deeper, you're closer to the Earth, to the, so, to the center of Mars, I bet. <laughs> um, so that's what we did. Um, we're in collaboration with EPFL uh, and with the support of the Mars Society Switzerland. So um, this was actually initiated by the Mars Society Switzerland, uh, he, who brought it to us. And then an EPFL master student took this on as his master's project. And we had um, Claude Nicolier, a former astronaut too, who supervised our work and uh, supported us through the different phases of the preliminary design mission. Mission design, my apologies. Um, on a more technical point, so uh, we divided the work as followed. Uh, of course, first and foremost, you have to study the Martian atmosphere, what's going on there, and how you can exploit it, in a way. Uh, for this, we use the Mars Climate Database, which is a NASA tool, very useful, gives plenty of information, and basically you can you just give the coordinates on Mars and it finds you every data that it has collected uh, through rovers, landers, and satellites. Um, so the design reference mission, it was really at the core of our um, of our study because it answers the question, why? Why do we want to send an airship there? Well, we want to send an airship there because we want to study those two points. This is Melas Kasma, which is the largest canyon in Mars, on Mars. And those two particular points have shown a very interesting um, geological history in the sense that it those two walls of the canyon reflect the history of Mars. And we haven't been able to approach them too much because, you know, well, land does not move, rovers not great for the canyon, and fly, um, helicopters, I mean, Ingenuity is doing a fantastic job, but it's simply not uh, what it's doing right now. It's not in Melas Gasma. So sending uh, an airship there would be quite interesting. And for those wondering, well, it's a canyon, it's pretty, it's not very big, is it? Because, I mean, the airship is going to be huge, of course. Uh, well, it's actually like 60 kilometers, so you have plenty of space to put an airship there. On a more technical aspect for engineers, um, our study went through different uh, aspects. So the composite material, what are you going to use? You need something strong and you need something light. So we are using three layers, uh, Vectron for load bearing, Mylar for gas retention, and Tedlar for weathering protection. As for the envelope, it's composed by H2 field. Uh, this is also, this would be obtained by ISRU, as uh, was mentioned before. So ISRU is an uh, institute of resource utilization. The idea is that through electrolyse, you can um, generate enough H2 to sustain your airship. Um, the propulsion, what we offered, what we presented was two propellers of about four meters diameter each, uh, and that would allow to compensate some winds of uh, 10 meters per second, more or less. Once again, this number, 10 meters per second, was collected from the Mars Climate Database. Um, and finally, the power ne necessary for this uh, would be obtained through solar cells, which is a really interesting and emerging technology, which is, uh, as its name indicates, cells, so very small uh, pieces of materials that you can put on top of your uh, of, of my airship envelope, of, on top of my <coughs> um, on top of my balloon, uh, in order to 
to generate the same way uh, energy as solar panels, but it's much more flexible. So it's quite interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's a growing technology that, uh, that is very interesting. So finally, the great thing is that when our first master student finished his uh, semester project, three new ones came along. So right now we have three EPFL students working on uh, three different aspects. So envelope material and shape, propulsion and altitude control, and navigation and data handling. And so we submitted those results uh, for the IAC 2022 call for abstract, and we hope to um, hear back from them. And uh, last year, as Julie mentioned, we went to the GLEX, uh, so the space conference uh, organized by the IAF. Um, so we had the opportunity to present our work uh, during this conference. Now, this is another experiment of mine, the energy optimization. The idea is to publish a paper in order to present in numbers what do we need to sustain a space station either on the moon or on, on the moon, sorry, or Mars. On my case, I'm going to focus on Mars, of course, because I'm at the MDRS. So the idea is to, uh, to collect all of the data from generators, from uh, power supplies, from uh, water tanks, um, every system necessary to sustain the MDRS is going to be studied, and we are going to try to understand how it is optimized, how we could optimize it more, and what are the basic necessities in order to have a space station. Thank you, Lauren. So my project as an astrobiologist uh, is mainly focused on the geology of the Mars uh, Research Station. So I'm interested in looking for biosignatures, so they're basically traces of life uh, in rocks. And what I'll do uh, is that I will collect rock samples that I will carefully pick. Uh, I don't have a lot of time or money or space. Uh, so there will be a lot of preliminary uh, work to do beforehand. And then I'll do some uh, sort of analysis of the MDRS. Uh, most of the observations can be uh, done on the field first. Very valuable observations. And then they have as well optical microscopes that I will be able to use to identify, to identify minerals, for example. But um, mainly this project will be also part of uh, my PhD, so I will be able to take those samples back uh, to the lab in Canada and um, perform uh, further analysis on those samples, mainly with mass spectrometation. Um, so why would I want to collect rock samples uh, in Utah? Well, one of the reasons why uh, Utah is an analog and why MDRS is an analog station is because not only it's isolated in the desert, but also the landscape and the surroundings of the station can be quite similar to what we can find on the surface of Mars. So here are some um, elements of landscape that we can find uh, in Utah from uh, patterned grounds to uh, lacustrine sediments, volcanoes, impact craters, etc. And the station is located west of Hanksville. And we can find similar features of the landscape both in Utah and on Mars. Uh, very large scale features, for example, um, sand dunes. So on the left side is the Little Sahara uh, sand dunes, uh, which is uh, in the western part of Utah. And on the right side is sand dunes from the Hellespontus region on Mars. Uh, still on a very large scale, uh, we can find well river deltas. Uh, here on the left side is the Weber uh, delta in Utah, and on the right side is uh, what we call the Paleo delta. So it's a delta that is fossilized uh, in the Holder Crater region on Mars. And finally, on a much smaller scale, on a centimeter scale, we can find what is called the blueberry concretion. So they look like these uh, dark blue beads. Uh, that are mainly, at least on uh, Earth, uh, made of hematites, so they're iron oxides. And in some cases on Earth, they can be um, formed, uh, catalyzed by some kind of biological activity. So that's why they are very relevant for astrobiological studies. And we can find them both uh, in the Grand Staircase Escalented uh, Monument in Utah, in the southern part of Utah, and as well, uh, they have been observed on the surface of Mars in the Meridiani Planum area. So now I'm talking about traces of life, but what kind of traces of life uh, could I expect to find? So there's different types. 
uh, and each type uh, requires a different uh, technique and instrument. So it goes from um, organic molecules. Uh, you probably have heard of uh, organic molecules found by the Curiosity rover or soon uh, by the Perseverance rover on Mars. And they mostly require mass spectrometers. Then we have the uh, classic uh, fossils and other patterns, structural patterns. So we can have well, microscopic fossils like uh, dinosaurs that you all know. But also on a microscopic scale, we can have fossils of bacteria, for example. And these uh, will usually require um, optical, optical microscopes, but they can obviously also be observed on the field. Then we have other uh, uh, chemical signatures. So typically the elemental fractionation, uh, rare earth elements are very common to use. Uh, depending if you have a biological activity or not, uh, they will intake heavier rare earth elements or not. Uh, also, isotopic fractionations of carbon and oxygen is uh, a quite a uh, useful indicator. And finally, um, a type of signature that tends to be more controversial, it's uh, called biominerals. So it's minerals that can, in some cases, be catalyzed by some kind of biological activity. Uh, you can spot those on the field with your naked eye, or you can use uh, well, hyperspectral imaging, for example, like uh, the camera that Alice will be using on the station, or just typical microscopes. Um, so what I'll do again is that I will collect those samples. Um, I will mostly focus both um, biological patterns, so uh, microfossils, and organic molecules as well. Uh, obviously, the organic molecules, I can only try to uh, detect them at the, at the research facility with mass spectrometers. And, uh, well, hopefully I'm expecting to publish some peer-reviewed, actually my supervisor expects me to publish some peer-reviewed papers. <laughs> and to conclude this presentation, a word about education and outreach. Um, so, we're not only a team of scientists that want to do science, we also want to inspire other um, younger candidates to apply, but also other, um, both young girls and boys to join the space sector. Um, we believe that uh, going on uh, all female analog missions like this one provides real life examples of uh, women profession, uh, space professionals. Uh, and it's also a great experience to gain, a uh, great opportunity to gain hands-on experience in the space sector and analog environments uh, more specifically. So uh, what we do as outreach activities is like talks and conference. Uh, usually it's less uh, technical uh, talks. And we hopefully um, at some point want to open uh, those missions to um, younger candidates. And on the education side, uh, we collaborate uh, regularly with local schools in Geneva uh, to give workshops or to take them out at the local uh, the, uh, space museums, etc. So on that note, thank you very much for your attention. And please reach out to us if you have any. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was amazing, very interesting project. Nice to see other things that are sweet space as well. Not very common indeed, and amazing project. So I was wondering, how do you organize yourself, meaning that you're six in the, in the crew? And so how do you deal with the fact that you have to handle scientific projects, I imagine also finance management? And then you have to plan the mission, so flight plan, um, how does it work? A great question. <laughs> well, um, as you saw, the project started in 2019. Uh, there was COVID in the meantime, so it gave us quite a bit of time to try to reorganize ourselves. Uh, we were not expecting to uh, this project to uh, develop further than just one mission. Um, but apart from having each one of us having a specific role in the crew, so I'm the commander and geologist, Lorraine is the engineer, we have the data scientist, Every single crew member is responsible for their own uh, research project, uh, except Paola. She's supervising. 
She's supervising the, the core uh, research experiments uh, about uh, gender domination in analog environments. Other than that, uh, we recently well, reorganized the organization in having different working groups. So I'm responsible for the logistics uh, and the education part. Uh, Lauren is responsible for science. science. <laughs> 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 And then uh, we have um, Christina, she's responsible of the, the finding uh, funding. And I think that's it, we have three working groups. Yeah, uh, we, we did actually, uh, fund in fact, we had an Australian with us for a while, uh, and eventually it didn't work out, n not only, but also because of the logistics precisely, because already finding a, a timeline for the six of us is crazy, if you, and we are all in Europe. And if we have to add to this the time delay with Australia, it's, it was just, it, it's not possible. So us being European and European based really helps too with the logistics. And just to a final uh, note is that yeah, it's going to be our um, first analog mission. Um, we've been learning a lot uh, throughout the whole process. Uh, we're going to learn a lot more, hopefully. And um, after this first mission, we hope that we will have some kind of uh, procedure protocol that we can follow that will smooth all the process. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Shall I just say? No, I'll make you all. Um, this is more a work related, um, as I also work in the space sector, and then you do the analog missions on the side. How did? your network or your company responded to you doing this mission and spending your free time on this as well, being worried probably about your mental health and your priorities at work? Um, yeah, it's always a bit weird when you uh, start the job interview by saying, so I'm going to have to take two weeks off. <laughs> um, but eventually they, I mean, Whenever we talk about the project, we're so passionate about it that we, we, we send the message that really it's something that's very close to our heart, that we've invested a lot of time and energy into it. And it is very interesting. It's, it's not just two weeks of vacation tanning your butt, you know, it's actually making science, hopefully publishing, meeting great people, putting yourself in, 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 in a stressful situation. So it is skills that will be also applicable to my work life. Um, and as for periods of preparation, usually we try to uh, meet once a week and it's evening, so we, we, we handle this as such. We always have someone, so we have like three PhD students in our group, uh, always one in a lab, so sometimes, <laughs> sometimes uh, we're not all six of us here because one of us has to finish something with a microscope or science things, you know. <laughs> so yeah. Thank you. Uh, if I may, a small comment uh, from uh, Bernard. Uh, MDRS was uh, actually one of our first Euro and Mars campaign, and it was a life-changing experience for many of us. And uh, from the science point of view, uh, if you're interested, I put in the chat uh, some of the articles that uh, we put, uh, we, we published because it was actually a science-driven campaign, but then we realized that there were many other aspects than science. Uh, of course, uh, the, the simulation, the human aspect, and uh, many of the, of the participants, they have continued. And, uh, and then uh, we wish you also the best for your platform, Boomers, uh, to, uh, to grow and to engage even more uh, uh, young female, but also the male. Huh? So of course, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your kind words, and we'll definitely check out the links. And yes, male are crucial to Womos. I mean, it's definitely uh, to include males into the missions as mission control or others is definitely uh, in our goal eventually. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, so back to the microphone. <laughs> um, refreshments is in about 20 minutes. There might be already there, so just take some time. Uh, if it would be great if you got out of the room. The reason is because we're gonna 
move a bit the chairs together so we can do a workshop. I think now that we have all this presentation, we've got a few more tomorrow morning, we've got quite a bit of information and now it's time to share before we go for a walk in Cambridge and to the pub. Um, so it'd be lovely if uh, just have a coffee and also this three main topics I think that we could discuss in those workshops but it's up to you guys. One of them is habitats and I do have two people right there doing a space architecture workshop so I think it's a very important part of um, space mission that we could discuss. So we have one group doing habitats, then there's another one that could be uh, on spacesuits, and another one could be on the experiments. We could have a fourth one on astronaut recruitment but I think that's more kind of a personal choice rather than a workshop itself. So I will just have a show of hands who prefers experiments and who prefers spacesuits. So the spacesuits. So okay. So just three, four, five. Okay. I mean we can split even three groups if necessary. It's just good if you have a representative of each mission in each group um, so that you can really say well in our mission we're doing like this. Uh, and how many people would prefer to do Experiments. Okay, so the rest of you are just neutral and they're going to do habitats. Okay, so let's do three groups, then we just move the chairs around and we'll just sit down and enjoy. Okay? Go for coffee. Yeah. Yeah. All right.